Yeah. So, yes. Thank you all for these very interesting um, presentations that, that kind of focused on a lot of different things. <laughs> uh, Mick and I will try to pinpoint some of them. And, and all of you, please, we'll try to pick up. Wow, well, there's already a lot of, of, of comments here. Um, um, uh, let's see. So, I was thinking about, uh, Jenna, do, you mentioned uh, Marina Garces and how she talks about how you decompose, you need to, when you step out into the real, I think one has the real, I, I think a very big difference between working in a gallery space and stepping outside into the realities that we've heard about here is, is that um, in the process you need to be prepared to change. I think that is something about what you said. Um, and I'm curious about, and also Shashtin, you mentioned that in order to work in new ways, you have, in order to create new things, you need to work in new ways or something like that. And I'm curious about this transformative mode that we somehow need to embody, both as, as, as artists, I think, but also as organizations. So when we, uh, or Renzo, when, when you step outside of, of, of the art context where you are and, and try to, to transform it to another place um, that I would imagine involves uh, being ready to question yourself and transform yourself into that process. I'm just curious about that um, because it seems like, like a very important quality of these kinds of works is, is the readiness to reconsider and still keep a kind of direction of your work, but that transformativity, if you like. Hmm. Certainly, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. that's the, the, the point is, to me, when you say you have to be ready to put your subject position, I think mm -hmm. Jean spoke about it as well, uh, at stake. Or, um, I mean, we all claim, I think, that art, that's the one thing art can do, or wh why it's good for society, or why it's good for human individuals, why it's this one field of expertise or knowledge production in which the very position of the one who uh, steps into this field is, uh, can be questioned. Um, so that, that's why I suggested, I saw it coming back in one of the tweets, I can't read Swedish, but I'm sure, like, uh, They're moving around. you know, go, doing that this conference should actually also take place in, in this uranium mine in, in Botswana, where without whose work we couldn't see each other now, um, the work of these miners, or the people who were pushed away from that land for a mine to um, be established there, for us now to be able to see each other through the electricity that they give us. Uh, th that, of course, directly involves our subject positions as partakers in this, uh, in this discussion. That's the whole point. Yeah. Mm. I, w I wonder, it, it, it strikes me that in your challenge to us to consider who's included in the conversation that we have where we rehearse being critical, yeah. um, I'm, which I think is like it's absolutely uh, fundamental and necessary challenge, it's really important, but I wonder how do you think that challenge relates to say what's happening in the projects that we've seen, say if we take Park Lake or if we take uh, Jana's work in Rotterdam or um, do, do you see that the challenge you're making to us to have solidarity, to, having, to have conversations with more than just the, those who get the benefit of the current distribution of inequality mm -hmm. do you see that those practices are Addressing this, are they realizing it, or do you do you still see there's some there's some fundamental exclusion operating? Well, I don't think I want to be a purist per se. I think on many levels one can operate, and I just happen to choose this global inequality scope and the distribution of the places where people can you know rehearse criticality. Uh, I, I like to take that as um, my my vantage point. Uh, I'm not saying at all that other points of departure are therefore invalid. Not at all. Um, of course.
course, we, if I conflate the, the, the lectures so far, which I shouldn't do, but um, of course we do know uh, that you know many artist, collaborative artistic practices are serve directly or indirectly urban regenerations, sometimes very openly. The work, she has been mentioned many times, Rosalind Deutsch wrote fantastic pieces about that too, uh, how uh, gentrification, uh, you know, through the rehearsal of criticality is really, um, um, yeah, something that is, goes very much against what the critical claims of art are. And, and we are all part of that. So then the question is, in my mind, um, do we play the game knowing that we're part of neoliberal politics? Is it enough to just reflect on that in the project and conduct the project anyway? So is art to be something that mirrors society, reflects upon society, or is it something that allows itself that to, to, to go in and just play its part? These are two different views, I guess, of what art can be. Is it a mirror? Does it need to have a critical reflection? Or is it there to create good atmosphere but, somehow? But wouldn't you think that... I mean, it seems to me that the, 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 three, pra the three artistic practices that were represented were, were all interventionists. They, yes. they were not representational. They no, no, that's like, what I mean. Yeah. They're interventionists, but, yeah. But in terms of their interventions, there are slight differences. Yeah. I mean, you and Jeanne in the bakery piece, I mean, there's the idea that the agency of the constituencies that you're working with is connected to them having some kind of economic basis. There mm. must be, there's a commercial activity that, and, and you're very emphatic that it's the precondition. If, if I can't feed myself, I can't have the conversation, I can't go to the conference. So there's something about the way in which you link the agency that's unfolded in these situations with uh, economic activity. Um, but uh, uh, Sherston in the Park Lake project, the, the <coughs> You didn't, you, you didn't make an intervention in relation to economy. It was primarily the question of who's showing up to have a conversation and the, the parallel parliament, something that happens in parallel. But I'm just wondering, is, there, is this question of seeing that the agency that unfolds is sometimes must be tied into a question of economic action? Because that's precisely where... The, the challenge comes and people say, oh, you're agents of neoliberalism because you're, you're marketizing, you're bringing in those kinds of but, things. But we are. I mean, and I think that's one of the points that you're making with your work is that we are part of this system. We cannot ever claim that we're not a part of it. But I think it is the, the understanding of the role and the understanding of uh, the variety of positions possible to make. But it's also... A, um, uh, what I like with both your works is that it calls attention to these patterns that are underlying and that it also questions my role as an artist. I have to rethink it and I have to re uh, rediscover and try and try again different ways of, of acting. And I think the aim of at least what I, when I look backwards on Pack Play was to try and see was it possible to through just listening to create some kind of shift in the definition of who was actually economically going to benefit from this. I would disagree that we per se are of that, a part of that neoliberal agenda. I think if we are much stronger and more radical in acknowledging that we are, then we can, of course, do something else. Mm. But it requires to first really come to just institutional critique of our own practices. Mm. That's the prerequisite of anything mm. that could possibly transgress it. And, and certainly that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. Yeah. So to back to your earlier question, um, in, in my case, or in the case of the work I'm trying to do, again with many other people, the Congolese Plantation Workers Art League and uh, a number of people. We, we try, of course it is an intervention and you could almost call it like a regeneration project in which 
people sit together and produce something that they can sell and self-representation leads to the finances to build the center on art and inequality in Congo. So it's an intervention in that way, but at the same time, it is also this mirror, in a way, this institutional critique type of self-analysis of global economic systems and art's role within it. Um, they tie together somehow. So I think the level of self-analysis is what can probably bring it beyond just being, can bring art beyond just being a, a an agent for neoliberal or an implementation of neoliberal politics. Do you want to come in on this, Jana? Yeah, but my head goes like in three or four different directions. Yeah. So, uh, because it's, it's, so maybe to, to, for me, for instance, I, I hear your argument uh, about who's not at the table. It's a big question, looking at who's not at the table and making sure that uh, they are, there is a way for them to be at the table. But for me, for instance, that doesn't necessarily have to be as far out as you go, because for instance, in the south of Rotterdam, that's there everywhere. Or actually, it is already around us everywhere. So it's not, uh, it doesn't have, you, you don't have to go very far distance to find people or to be among people that are not on the table. The question is how um, how much are you yourself uh, sort of like um, uh, vulnerable to allowing um, uh, different opinion to be at the table? Because different op opinions to be at the table means also that they might not underwrite your idea of criticality. There could be a different idea of criticality. Mm -hmm. So uh, because otherwise. Uh, inviting people on, on the table to underwrite our idea of criticality is another form of imper imperialism. So I think so to be open to different forms of criticality uh, and uh, and to allow for that uh, is something uh, is something that I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about. How do I do that? How do I allow for other really even other political ideas than mine to surface or to be voiced within uh, the projects we are working on? And then how to, in some way, find a way to work together despite all the, the various different stands, especially uh, in the south of Rotterdam. This is a big thing because we are a multiplicity of different ethnic backgrounds, people political uh, preferences, but people also religious preferences. And so still we have to figure it out somewhere there. So how do we do that, figure that out? And, and what are the vehicles that then can produce some form of commonality that I wonder. And I always, I always say that when I talk more at length and in detail about certain projects, for instance, like the fact that Liverpool is a bakery was not because I embarked on making a bakery. I was there looking at the situation, the Derer situation that was happening and just wondering how this state, we, we could get into a state like this and, and what... So I was just there listening to people describing, like Angela, thing. the fact that it became a bakery was because we were setting up camp in this former empty bakery and whenever we were there, people were knocking the door and were saying, like, do you sell bread? Do you have cake, love? <laughs> and we were, no, sorry, you know, this bakery is closed <laughs> for a while. But then the next meeting, somebody baked a cake at home, uh, brought a cake and said, that when somebody comes in, we can cut a a slice and give him a coffee and a slice of cake. And then the next day, somebody else overbaked the other person. So before you know, we had cupcake sessions. You know, I never thought that cupcake sessions could lead to, to this kind of, of resistance, but it turned out to be a very meaningful means. So, like, I am a little bit wary to, to, to think about these processes and of maybe asking other people on the table, but then still, you know, bringing our own idea of criticality. So there, there, I, I am. That was one part of the the, 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 the thing I'm struggling with, and there were three more. But maybe. there's a question here from the audience. How did you how did you stay the, or maintain the engagement of these people in the project? I think it's I don't maintain the engagement. Mm -hmm. We maintain the engagement, and in this case, it's. It's through f having 
uh, an object, uh, which in this case the baking turned out to be, through which people felt uh, they could uh, discuss their their situation because it bred this sustenance and, 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 and livelihood and economy. So that turned to be a vehicle. And, and I think when people started to get involved, they sort of make sure to maintain that engagement among themselves. And of course, there is frustration. There's every time frustration in these processes. So it's also not a happy, clappy process. It's, uh, it's also not about victory or we will survive. It's not about that. It's about a repetitive struggle, about being prepared to keep struggling, as, as Zeno said, although we might not be able to overthrow, but that we, in, in our daily struggling, manage to... To, to, to obtain skills to at least continue that struggling. Because I'm also a little bit, that was one of the other things, afraid of like, like this idea that the intervention is going to be the change, create the change or to be the survivor. So, and I don't see it as like fixed outcomes. I see it as an ongoing struggle. But that's something I think that's the most hardest thing to, to accept at some point that... Uh, um, that this continuous struggling is something we have to not only invite other people in with their criticality, but it's also something that we have to embody as a permanent state mm -hmm. of being. And I think that is something that, that, that for me is, is, is very important and for the position as an artist important to think about what does that mean to, to inhabit that process critically and artistically without necessarily it forcing it to an end. But also not necessarily to say like anything goes or the process is at all, but to understand that this repetitive and repeated and recurrent uh, intervention is what is needed. So, you know, there are some, some things that, that, that I say. So then, then it's our collective responsibility to keep people engaged, because it's keep inviting people to be on that table, despite the frustration or despite the dissonance. Mm. Is that, yeah. I, I wonder could, to, to move to a slightly different zone, and it's partly taking account of what Julie presented at the end, where she describes a kind of framework of, of, of the culture, microculture of day-to-day -day practices around commissioning and production of public work. And I, I guess it gives us a very particular picture of a, a kind of strange entanglement, but, but one that doesn't feel especially compelling and mm. like it's not... But I'm thinking about how things are initiated. Because in, in some of the projects, like Park Lake, many of the public faculties, um, and I'm not clear in relation to the Institute for Human Activity, but I get the impression that, that it is self-initiated. It's not a question of a major agency or other player coming and saying, <coughs> we want you to do X. It's a question of an initiation that maybe at a certain point starts to entangle other players. And I'm just wondering about that because I guess one, many of the people here, I would imagine, are people from commissioning agencies or from local authorities who want to support and enable forms of critical practice. But it's just that it seems that so many of these examples are where the artist or some other player has initiated outside of a framework. And I'm, I'm also thinking of the fact that you engage constituencies who have not necessarily invited you. Sometimes you are inviting yourself. And I, I just, I suppose, how things start, where things start, and this question of can this also be something that starts within the initiative of a public agency or some other player? I don't know who wants to... Do what you I sort of picking up on that it's not compelling and I guess no it isn't compelling <laughs> so um, and I guess that's why I previewed my friend's response to so kind of that experience of being in the in the day to day of the mundanity of how a planning office actually does run but planners in urban situations are really key agents in the commissioning of work and the delivery of, of work so for me Personally, it feels really important to get in on that table 
in on that project secretariat that is delivering projects, that is looking at developing relations with commissioning agencies and, th and understanding how, how, they, how they tick. And how they tick is in the making of the urban, the, the city, and that the making of those works and the relationships with artists is part of the making and the relationships, the, the, the really complex relationships um, of that city. And for me, although I went there hoping in a way to find projects like yours, <laughs> and uh, I didn't. I didn't find that. I found like quite traditional in a way public artworks being uh, commissioned and made. But I think the opportunity there was presented to really see how the making of those objects and those making projects happened amidst the professional sort of practice. So of engineers and construction workers and how making those sculptures and objects made them reflect on what it was that they were actually doing. What is this regeneration? Why are we doing this? Who should be involved? And I'm not saying that art is making. I'm, not, I'm certainly not saying that's the sort of public art that people should be commissioning. Not at all. That's not my message. I guess the outcome of that research is really revealing the, those relationships and thinking there's, there's, there's spaces to get into, there's ways to get into and understand that the making of cities is, is that sort of relational process. And for me, it's my continued interest is looking at ways to be a, a planner, ways of communally being planners and, and planning together. But Does I guess that it's that sense? planning together, because it seems to me that one impression one could get from the projects is that it needed to be an initiation from outside of mm. the existing yeah. planning discourse mm. or the exi it, that that enable, mm. that, that let something else happen because people mm. started, I mean, it, it, with Jana and Shurston, that they begin, um, they don't, they, you, you start walking around the park and filming and talking to people, mm. or you set yourself up in, in the park again in Macedonia. No one has invited you mm -hmm. to do that. You declare and announce and say, we're going to talk to you. And out of that, other things start to um, happen. Yeah. And at a certain point, other agencies may be brought in or may not. But I'm just wondering, is that necessary that it must always start a little bit to the outside? Or is it possible that it, that it could happen within... Like, could we have a commissioner or a, public, a local authority making the invitation and somehow still have that, that kind of critical edge of the work be realised? The answer would be from me that I, I don't really know, but the experience I've had is that in, about in, in several of the projects I've been in, that uh, it's a question of imagining the possibility. And then it's a question of time. So that a lot of planners, and many of them might be here today, they have defined the problem. They can uh, analyze you know, who, who's not at the table and who, who should be. And... Uh, there's a lot of work being done in the dialogues between the, the different people in the municipality. But they are, they are not able to work like this because their work is regulated through um, a lot of uh, rules that I could constantly break. And in the start of my work, I didn't know that this was the fact what I was doing. So I was like a free agent that could walk in between different people, different structures, and set up situations in the same way that you do it, um, that, that would open for a dialogue that was not predefined. And this pre not being predefined is something that the municipality is working hard not to have. So for instance, the, the model of meeting we had which was with no agenda. And this opened up for just automatically for different subjects. So, but that can be taken now on. So it's sort of like they, if it's tried, sometimes it sticks and they keep on doing it. And then they could be commissioning bodies if this was sort of accepted by the ones who decide in municipalities, for instance. But I would also think that, that we see a lot of artists working in this way and then we have structures for public art that are based on 
on <clears throat> permanency and, and often uh, the 1% rule is, is, is not, we can think that it's, it has many different aspects, but it does tie the artworks to be uh, in a certain kind of way. And, and it, it doesn't really open up for the possibilities or, or it would have to be transformed. Um, so the structures would have to be transformed in able to um, harbour or, or, or invite artists to work in other ways. And I think that we need to, uh, um, uh, this, this kind of uh, deconstructing ourselves and rebuilding ourselves again, we need to do that as institutions uh, in order to understand, to grasp what's really going on and what artists are actually working on and how can we then integrate that in the systems and allow the systems to transform and change with the needs that we see in the planning processes from citizens and the practices that artists are already out there doing. But, but this, in this case, it's really important work that you guys do, as we've spoken about many times, that it's really important to support realization of one of two projects that really could then stand as a possibility that can convince all the other bodies. Yes. So I think it's important what you guys do in, in the future, in, the, in this program, million program session, that will be really important for, for how this work can be continued in many levels. Maybe one, one <clears throat> point I would like to add is, I, I tried to mention it earlier, but I was not precise in it, and maybe I can be a little bit more now, hopefully. Um, art can generate good gestures. People bring people together, discuss, uh, op bring other people to the pa table, etc. It can, and it seems like this is the scope, to some degree, of this conversation and maybe of this entire conference, how uh, commissioners and public agencies can, you know, bring beautiful, kind, happy deeds into society through artists producing them or generating them. And that's great. It's great. And we have to do it. Um, then I would argue society is much larger than just Sweden or any mun municipality uh, because, you know, we're really tangled in this global inequality uh, status quo, and so if you really take your task seriously, it cannot be limited to, as I pointed out earlier, the uh, winning parts of this uh, um, um, of this inequality. However, what is even more important, I think, for art and why what distinguishes art from any other field of uh, of activity is that it has this long legacy of uh, fundamentally dealing with the uh, with the conditions of its own production. Like a painting is not merely some vision on some beautiful future or beautiful past, you know. It's also a study on what it is to be a painting. So it, what it is to be canvas or what it is to, to be paint or what, how these things interrelate. So it's about the material conditions of itself. Uh, a, a glass that would be a piece of art would think about what it is to be a glass. Art is this one sphere of thinking and of acting in which forms and ideas and words can reflect upon themselves. So I think it's not enough to just have nice things happening everywhere, in, but there needs to be... Uh, if you want to call it art and not just bringing people together, it really has to structurally deal with its own conditions. Um, and so I think the best the best people to think about what should happen where, in what moment, are artists and not public agencies. Or you need to have public artists in these public agencies to decide what needs to happen. But I would be very uncomfortable if, some, if uh, the Dutch government or the Congolese government or Unilever would ask me, why don't you do some nice project on our plantation to make happier lives? That would be horrible. The only way why I think it's useful is because not only, yes, it will bring some happier lives, possibly, but because it really reflects on the structural conditions of these plantations and of art, what art could mean there. But isn't, isn't there a little bit of a problem here? In, on the one hand, you talk about getting your hands dirty, mm. and I think it's a little bit too... It's a, we might be a little bit careless if we characterise the different practices that we're talking about as feel-good sessions where people gather around. I think that in different ways these practices are often, often about people 
who are deliberately placing themselves in positions where their hands are dirty. I agree. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. and I think that what they're releasing in these situations is not um, the good society or the big society. What they're releasing is frozen conflicts. Like mm. in a segregated society mm. like Sweden, where we have you know, huge problems with segregation. So when you, instead of talk about segregation, but place yourself... In the, in the segregated moments and start to desegregate them a little bit. This is confl- the, the segregation is the frozen conflict, and the desegregation moment is where something else starts to happen. So I think t- to be careful not to call these as simply feel good no, things. No. On the other hand, I understood your critique earlier to challenge us not to get lost inside how skillful we are at criticizing mm-hmm. ourselves and producing our reflexivity, that, that you demanded that our refle- our, what we do now will some way create understanding that creates obligation for action, that there's a kind of a, a need to, to materialize our insight in what we do. So I, I think in a way the modernist reflexive stuff is maybe part of the problem, to get past this thinking about our conditions as art and maybe focus on some, some specific purpose in the world. I disagree. I disagree that we should get past it completely. I think if you have got people gathering around a table to desegregate, and I think that's fantastic and it happens and it needs to be done, I think it's an essential element of that discussion that you realize that the entire that, that the discussion itself is funded by yet another global segregation. Global economic apartheid is what we live in. And in some parts of that apartheid, we can have then discussions about desegregation. And they need to happen. I mean, people live on different levels. You live, you live in, an, you know, in your own body, you live in a house, in an area, in etc. On all these levels, we need desegregation, if you will. And of course, I'm very much in favor of it. But I think this modernist aspect, as you call it, of... Uh, understanding the material conditions of the art piece, which could be a conversation that you create, is extremely important. What use is it to create desegregated societies in Sweden, for example, or in the Netherlands, or what have you, if you are unaware, if you don't problematize, that this is only possible because elsewhere on the planet people are working for you and me and everybody sitting here for $20 a month. But you don't think it might be possible that the very act of desegregation immediately places the history of Gothenburg as part, uh, as part of its history is the history of Iran, is, is the history of Chile. You know, that there isn't, mm. that the moment you start to desegregate, this, this fantasy of the national self-contained thing is already... Sure, it, it will I, pop up. And I, I know, for example, now there's a whole thing happening in the UK where the history of slavery has been, you know, on houses of wealthy merchants. It's that... It, it has placards saying, oh, this person was active in the East India trade or in the Caribbean trade. It doesn't say this was a slave trader. Yeah? So it's important now, as part of this local desegregation, to paste placards, this was a slave trader. So you know about it, and we can deal with it. Um, I think it's very important to then realize that the very fact that you can fund that new placard, slave trader, on the house, is now funded by people we don't officially call slaves, but certainly they do slave labor uh, in this moment. And it's billions of them, really. It's not just a few pockets here or there. Um, otherwise, I think this, this little new placard is just gestural politics. And it, so it's a step to local desegregation, but it, it needs the modernist self-reflexivity, in my mind, in order to make sure the process is ongoing. But, but just in a, in a way, um, I totally agree with you. So it's not the, the only thing, and this is not to defend myself in relation to the project, but in these so-called million uh, program areas, which are uh, suburbs built in 10 years at the same time, one million suburbs, that's why they call that way, a lot of the population are people who actually come from areas in the world where there's mm-hmm. a lot of problems and a huge poverty. And they, at the same time, when they come to Sweden, they belong to the, the, the how do you say, it? they are living in really segregated conditions. But one of them, 
spoke to me about why it was important for him to participate. He was one of the guys who sat in the cafeteria, not doing anything, not having a job, speaking only his native language with his friends, and speaking about the politics in his own country. And then after he had participated on sort of a distance for a while, he described how important it was for him to experience on the first hand this long durational uh, model of integrating different kinds of views in different ways. And he described that as something that he would bring because his intention was to go back when there was a change in government. So, so, and that made me feel that it has an Im it's also an image mm. we're building and an image that can uh, float out as a kind of model for a, a possible thing useful also in his country. That's a vague hope I had mm. anyway. We have uh, slightly time to wrap up. I just wanted to pick up one of the more of the audience questions for your answer. There was the question of, of the self-portraits, if that was your idea or if it was the people who you work together with. And I, I would like to connect that to the idea of, of the Kirsten Höller project, if that was... Who's, who ah, yeah, yeah, came yeah. up well, with that? Kirsten Höller, I still have to meet him. I mean, I met him, but uh, in Venice, while thinking about global inequality... Uh, at the at the champagne bar, mm. um, exactly. so this is yet to. I, I have no idea really. I was just so the the, the chocolate um, sculptures. Um, well, th there are now twelve people within the Cercle d'Air, the, the Congolese Plantation Workers Art League, um, and a few of them were sculptors. They were plantation workers and sculptors. But they worked in... Um, so in that capacity, they made uh, self-portraits and all kinds of sculptures, mostly for tourists. Um, and, that is, and so that was the one thing, and they did it in wood, which was in their area the more traditional medium. Um, and so the idea that we should uh, try and add the sculptural qualities to, and, and, and of course the content that they bring, that we should, that we could probably do it in the chocolate that makes a trip to Rotterdam, or sorry, Amsterdam. Uh, I'm looking at Jan and then I think of Rotterdam. <laughs> uh, that's the headquarters of Unilever. Um, anyway, Amsterdam, so the, the, this chocolate makes a trip anyway. So the idea that we could use chocolate as a, as a medium that travels easily, much more easily than clay or wood, that was my idea, I must confess. But I just talked about it. Um, I said, well, this is a possibility. Um, and we, every m morning for months, we talk about everything, uh, the same as in any other art environment we just discuss all the time and then if time's up we start doing something um, so the idea that chocolate could be a vehicle was something i came up with just the knowing the question was was yeah. if, if the, the portrait the idea so the idea behind the self-portrait was it formed in the dialogue with the workers or was it rather commissioned upon no them? not commissioned mm. self-commissioned mm. but i'm part of the group in a way mm. yeah mm. i think the pieces are authored by Obviously, these plantation workers slash artists. Uh, Global Capitalism is the main author of the pieces, I think, because they do the whole chocolate chain, and that's, after all, the medium. And, um, and I'm part of it, too, a little bit. Yeah. And my, I vote... I think it's an interesting <laughs> question whom I vote for. And I, I must bring up the... the um, yeah. Marx... I'm wondering if Marx would have voted for the Communist Party because in all, all his, um, uh, his, his big task, obviously, he knew what he wanted, but in order to make his arguments valid for the time, he had to phrase them in what we would now call neoliberal policies. He used Adam Smith and all the, all the thinkers of you know, the, the, the free market uh, and, and the invisible hand. He used their arguments in order to formulate why it was going to go wrong. So he, if, if, he would probably now use uh, Fukuyama and I don't know what, uh, Richard Florida, etc., etc., to argue why art needs to take a completely different role in society. Um, so, of course, I am as far left-wing as one can imagine, but I use all the neoliberal arguments that I need. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's a good note. We can all have different contradictions and lots of different views and focuses. Thank you so much, and it's time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>